So yet, despite smart desire to retrieve and reinvest in this free world of capitalism, <coughs> it followed at the same time uh, an anti revivalist song. The journal of faith and truth, a return to the spirit of this prestigious artistic past, would not to its form. In the early years after independence, the most important model was the Moodle period, which had been, of course, a cornerstone of human history. As I'll explain, Marx celebrated Moodle art and architecture for its synthesis, quote unquote, of foreign and indigenous style. Construed since Kumar Swami's March with painting of 1916 as a quintessential partly and secular idiom spot the interpretation of course of the past, the Mughal period played a determinant role in the 1940s and 50s in the debate that opposes the whole Indian style to a modern international one. Marx's contributors prompted artists and architects to emulate the Mughal spirit of tolerance and innovation. The use of the past was, of course, particularly handy, <laughs> as in his most visible and most frequently praised pre colonial artistic legacy, it had really been one of the better known chapters of Indian art history, one whose glory and symbolism the British had, of course, used to root their own power in an indigenous visual language. So, symbolic of this uh, continuous uh, reuse of the Mughal past is the presentation until its uh, fourth year of publishing of Marx's contributors, as you can see under a very beautiful and detailed drawing one of the entrances of what the country's Jami Masjid, which is actually directly taken from Edward uh, Edmund Smith's 1980 and 97 portfolio of Indian architectural drawings, or colonial drawings. In the formative years of the review, an overall positive exemplary reading, as I said, of the Mughal period was one of the pillars of a wider Indian idea of India prevalent at the time, and that was very much supported in the pages of Mark. Though the Mughal period was the subject of diverging interpretations, a then dominant, very positive interpretation saw it as the principal pre-colonial exponent of Indian greatness, good governance, and religious tolerance. This conception gained momentum after independence, though it was already there before this, amidst plural and competing ideas of India and of its past. And in the 1940s and 50s, Marx's contributors participated significantly in this wider movement of ideas. In Marx, the best examples of this contemporary political synthesis in Adelkir belong to the Mughal past. The Mughal uh, legacy, especially that of the first <coughs> was inspiring for the ideas that shaped its artistic innovations, the synthesis of cultures and styles, of course, Hindu and Muslims, indigenous and foreign, that presented an example for the present generation. Implicit in this seemingly simplistic generalization was the notion of secularism, which was key to India's idea of the state. Um, though it is, of course, a debated concept and in political thought, it has been attached to the secularism to the artistic output of the Mughal period by art historians and critics from the beginning of the 20th century onwards with remarkable ease and consistency, despite, it goes without saying, the obvious anachronism in doing so. This has been so because of the celebrated, sophisticated urban cultural output of the Mughals as you well know, of Akbar's tolerant policies towards Islam Muslims, and of course, of his uh, much discussed philosophical experiments from the Imam and Gandhi. The rewriting of the syncretic past as a precursor to Indian secularism was rooted in a powerful political rhetoric of emotional integration, that's what it was called. As Nehru stated, India is a strange land whose peculiar quality is absorption, synthesis. When this capacity for synthesis became less, then India became weak. India was weak for several hundred years because it had become a close country, which did not look outside. Now, this perception of an emotional integration as well as of an Indian uh, composite culture, another key term promoted by Nero and other figures such as uh, Humayun Kabir, who was the Minister of Education and uh, Minister of Scientific Research and Cultural Affairs, the closest you can get to the Minister of Culture, was strongly related to Mark. According to Mark, the Mughals, under Akbar in particular, of course, not only blended Hindu and Muslim influences, 
but never I quote lost the characteristics of their own style, and therefore created another art that was genuinely Indian, a reading that contrasted with Orientalist interpretations of the Mughal past that stressed its foreign character. The model value of the Mughal period did not stand for literal imitation of the Mughals, but for an, an understanding of the precedent they set, of their exemplary potential, and therefore the need to participate in the writing of the history of Mughal art. So it's a lot also about promoting scholarship, if you will, of that in a quite rigorous way. As a vast repertoire of themes and uh, artistic styles and techniques, the influence of the Mughal period remained a source of inspiration up to the 20th century. As you know, its courtly culture was recuperated, diluted, transformed by rival and peripheral kingdoms, skipping here a lot of history, by the British, who used Persian as their official language up to 1835, paid allegiance to the Mughal emperors, officially at least, recycled Mughal architectural elements, we can see this here too, and organized grandiose Mughal displays of power, the doorways, and others. So as you know, the Mughal period has been the subject of highly politicized reinterpretations of its merits and flaws, problematically rigidified as a Muslim period in the writing of Indian history that is interpreted by colonial writing of Indian history. Its continuing relevance in the 20th century stems from the widespread use of the Mughal past to make sense of contemporary India, exaggerate and manipulate, of course, Hindu-Muslim divides, and after partition, an increased tendency to read back into history present-day divisions. Reactions to this rich and very malleable past have verged from geography to demonization with many gradations in between, ranging, of course, from the Muslim least hostility towards Akbar, who is perceived as a heretic, to the Hindu nationalist fixation on the foreign origins of the Mughal emperors and, of course, on the Mughal at the heart of these debates were competing clients on what the nation should be at the time. The model value of the Mughal period circulated in the model went beyond artistic concerns, it, uh, built really on this good image of the Mughal past, championed by this uh, dominant, uh, set, a set of dominant politicians and cultural protagonists of the period, um, and can be read as a symptom of this wider sense of purpose of the Nehruvian generation. For Nehru himself, uh, Akbar was the chief exponent of the synthesis of Hindu and Muslim cultures that had united India and shaped its architecture and language. In a sense, Nehru wrote, Akbar might be considered to be the father of Indian nationalism. At a time when there was little of nationality in the country and religion was a dividing factor, Akbar deliberately placed the ideal of common Indian nationhood above the claims of separatist religion. Now, the first article to deal with the Mughal past in Mark uh, was an article on the Old Delhi, which was published in the second issue, and which presented the various incarnations of the city of to Shah Jahanabad. Uh, many longer in depth treatments would follow, including several special issues. Um, the article was written by a vast range of uh, experts and scholars, uh, international ones, often um, John Irwin uh, was the keeper of the Indian section of the Victorian Albert Museum, Kenneth Tupper Codrington, a professor of Indian archaeology at uh, the London School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, um, Basil Craig, keeper of the Department for Oriental Antiquities at the British Museum, but also uh, Charles Fowley, a Delhi-based Hungarian born scholar and critic for the Statesman of Calcutta, Kalpan Dalawal, Herman Hertz, Percy Brown, Mokhaj Ahmed, just give you an idea of, of who wrote these texts. Nevertheless, uh, however exalting the rhetoric surrounding the Mughal period may have been, in its formative years, Mark refused to romanticize its legacy. This comes across, for example, in a series of um, black and white photographs that accompany a text on uh, the Taj Mahal by Abdus Fatsi. Set against uh, the text's critical appreciation of uh, the building, you can see a narrow, cropped Photographs of workmen suspended on bamboo pole scaffoldings thrown away at the buildings. Um, these were probably taken during the Second World War when the building was uh, under restoration, at least at the top uh, cupola of the platform. So instead of majestic frontal views, these sort of images that are typically reproduced and continue to be today, the mausoleum and its adjacent buildings were framed through these intricate bamboo poles. 
The extensive forward uh, gives away Marx's intentions to exhort readers to embrace modern architecture, its material, steel, and concrete, and the substantial building programs undertaken in those years. So it's not at all about the arrival of the past, about the reuse of motifs, or the use of marble. <laughs> Anand later, later explained his misgivings regarding the building, or rather its romantic qualification. The attention he paid to the movable built legacy lay elsewhere and the radical innovation it represented for its time and in the political will and manpower necessary for such achievements. In the second year, uh, Mark published a two-part article on uh, Fatih Sikri. Uh, the first part is a historical note, which is illustrated with color and black and white photographs on Sunil Jana. And the second part presented Fatih Sikri as this epitome of mobile synthesis. Fatih Sikri is, of course, the planned city built uh, Akbar, which served as the move capital from the 1970s to the early 1580s, with its characteristic blend of Hindu and Muslim architectural elements, was the place where the emperor, in a time of relative peace, that is, had experimented with religious philosophical ideas and where his patronage flourished. So the story goes. And it thus, it thus came to embody Akbar's uh, enlightened policies. Interestingly, um, in Mark, Fatih Sikri was consistently presented as this direct uh, precedent to Chandigarh. In this most ambitious post independence architectural project, of course, uh, commissioned in the 50s, associated with the Kabuzi, but of course actually achieved through uh, other foreign architects as well as in the Indian ones. So to this pair was added Jaipur in this second major classic, illustrated with uh, Photographs by Gatta Besson de Munar, Durga Bajpai's article uh, presented Jaipur as a model city built by Maharaja J. Singh, a man interested in science and technology, you know, of course, of the Janta Mantras and in the arts, and a form of logical equivalent to the lives of Akbar. In the orbit of Mughal power for the past two centuries and highly influenced by its court culture, Mon Jaipur was established in uh, 1728. After the death of Aurangzeb. Articles on the um, Indian plant city filled a larger program to learn and in short. I'll continue to um, To learn from India's past, but also to realign the Indian's Renaissance with a set of references and a genealogy of communication that had been bypassed by the Hindu started in Bengal. So this is really with realigning yourself with a different past and one that a lot of Indian artists, that is the quote unquote nationalist artists of the beginning of the 20th century, had completely bypassed, at least to a large extent with some major <laughs> exceptions. For Mark, um, perceived a new culture really as a hybrid, I call the composite culture that relied on a mix of influences. A reality, I quote, that tends to upset the narrow, chauvinist sense of nationalism of our leadership at a moment when they are genuinely seeking to knit together India into a nation. So in line with this reading, the Mughal period was also believed to be the only pre-modern period to have produced a secular artistic output and which therefore made the natural precursor to post grade seven art. In Mark, Mughal art and architecture was read as the sort of perfect expression of the society of its time. Um, this was used to underline the discrepancy between India's present mainly disappointing artistic achievements, that's what this very committed art criticism was about, also a lot of criticizing what was being done at the time. Later, um, the fusions and imitations of the Mughal architectural style was des were described as the work of epigons, and in line with Marx's anti-revivalist agenda, that is, I quote, even those two last centuries following the moment when the zenith of Mughal art was reached in the Taj Mahal had not simply been a period of decadence, as their art had always been the true and appropriate expression of the Kanpur society and ideals. Um, therefore, it was really the Mughal legacy as a whole that was salvaged as a true reflection of its time. Now, of course, Mark could not completely uh, do away with this idea of decadence and plague the interpretation of the Mughal past. 
But the decay, of course, was attributed to multiple causes, including a local type decorative motif started under Shah Jahan, the dilution um, of the Mughal style in peripheral kingdoms from the end of Jahangir's rule, and especially the 18th century, and later the imitation of Western art practices, rather, of course, exclusively than to um, Oranza. An article by Gertz in Mark's special issue on uh, later Mughal art even praised Akbar's uh, stunts often defined, I would say, rather clumsy uh, Bibi Garwaza, the mausoleum built um, as you may know in homage to his mother during Akbar's reign and sort of a very pale copy uh, of the Taj Mahal. <laughs> it further stated that uh, though people may disagree, the second half of the 17th century no doubt represents the zenith of the political and cultural development initiated a century earlier by the great Akbar. So to link, of course, the evolution of art with that of its society was not a historical commonplace. In the past, Havel had sought to turn away from the literal application of Western classical criteria and present quote-unquote Indian, that is in his case Hindu art, as the visual embodiment of Indian philosophy. Mark, by contrast, rejected the overly spiritual Hindu-oriented interpretation of the minar, but it retained the term Indian, which respectively projected onto this new cultural synthesis that I told you about. Future art and architecture had to be inclusive, but it had to be Indian above all. Though it's actually unclear what this actually meant in uh, practical terms, and it remains, of course, today the subject of debate. And Mughal art and architecture play the next domain, a determining role in this respect. So to conclude, in an editorial published in December 63, Arnold decried the fact that Mark's program had not materialized in any form of sustained artistic output. The editorial did cite architects just Minet de Silva, Mino Mystery, Jahangir de Moria, and Doga Bachwai would follow the synthesis so strongly advocated in the review. But the continued imbalance between present production and past glory marked the end of this optimistic period. From the mid-50s, Mark gradually opted for a thematic approach, and by the 60s, it dedicated each issue of its editorial to a more narrowly focused topic and stopped publishing regular exhibition reviews and portfolios of contemporary artists. Specific media, styles, and period will now be treated uh, independently. Its writers, of course, never lost touch, actually, with the art world of the time. Anand would serve as the chairman of the Lions Academy from 1965 to 1970s, when the um, Triangle India happened, the first edition, at least, uh, he's the one who's at the helm of it. And Mark's list of contributors remained authoritative. However, by the mid-60s, European critics, who've been uh, prominent uh, in the Indian art world, had left India, most of them at least, and the Progressive Artist Group uh, had dissolved, at least officially so. As we've seen, the journal's rule inspired synthesis was also never part defined in empirical terms. The distinction between the historical catalyst and straightforward imitation was never quite resolved. And with the death of Nero in 1964, the character of Indian politics eventually changed, though of course this idea of India actually survived after his death. And even today, the synthetic rhetoric is still very much attached to Indian's moral artistic legacy, even if it has lost, of course, its grip on Indian's political imagination. Thank you. Well, you continue to have some critics who are advocates, of course, 
of a more hindrance factor to the Orientalist or Bengal also nationalist inspired form of Indian art. Uh, you also have most importantly in architecture a strong debate on revivalism. And that's something we forget today because uh, one thinks much more of the concrete architecture of Delhi, of the PWD having been centered on Delhi, and one has the names of all the great architects at the time in mind. But more or less until Chandigarh, revivalism was still extremely important in the built landscape of India. So the modern, so it's not only about the Mughal past has of course competition, but also at the same time modernist art and architecture have a great deal of competition um, in terms of imposing also the ideas that are behind some of these artists uh, remember that you also have uh, court cases against some of these artists uh, for instance when they were meant to have the, done erotic sketches or paintings this was the case of course of Shankar and others Akbar Nancy. Um, so these are two roles in the broader landscape that one is dealing with and that one has to constantly remember to understand the struggle that a lot of these critics and curators and artists were contributing to. I actually have one question. Um, I don't know if you spoke to this, uh, but to my knowledge, I don't remember. Um, what was the ecology like in terms of other publications? Like, I think you said that Mar was sort of attempting to fill in a gap in terms of a discourse about certain things, but were there other publications about art and architecture of the time that obviously existed in a certain gap but weren't filling the gap that then Mar sought to fill in? Um, so first, um, there were publications before. I have to acknowledge from and the call the modern review, so which published a lot and produced a lot of the artists associated, as I mentioned, with the Bengal Renaissance of the 20th century, and critics such as also the art and historians such as Chandra and Sarkar, a very different interpretation of the Mughal period, it goes without saying, especially of Anangzan, uh, though being himself a scholar of the Mughal period, which I think is an interesting thing. Um, then we also had, of course, um, Roman publications. And later on, we have um, a lot of the newspapers, including the Times of India, our instance, artistic director, who start publishing reviews. So it's not the same as being an illustrated magazine or one dedicated to art, but these are still you know, platforms for the dissemination towards a broader audience of at least some artistic debates. Later on, so a few years after Mark, you have the creation of Design Magazine, where Edmonton Batman Singh in Delhi, for instance, so dedicated to architecture, but not only. I mentioned uh, Lalit Kala, we have two Lalit Kala magazines, one dedicated to contemporary art, another one to more historical periods, and of course now there's a diversity I haven't mentioned at all that we skip to today, of course, there are many more um, outputs. Uh, what's interesting also is within these magazines, including those like Mar, which have a very long life, the difference between the sort of very um, invested art writing and something that then at some point becomes perhaps more descriptive, less challenging of the contemporary art scene, and slightly more disinvested at least of the contemporary stakes. So there's one thing is of course the multiplication of platforms, and then there's the other thing which is to look more specifically at the sort of voices that emerge and how they play out in regard to the contemporary artistic production of the time. Thank you for the enlightening talk. So I just have a, like a question as an observer. Um, as you mentioned, the Indian art was, um, uh, it was full of senses because of which it was able to achieve what it did. And especially it uh, kind of resonates with us in this current day and age, given the fact that it's happening in India, where it's being, uh, the Indian identity is being, you know, uh, being all the question and being contained into, into a more, um, Hinduized um, traje trajectory. So, do you, and so my question is: so Do you think that the Indian or the Mughal uh, art, um, had it not been, had it not come to India, would it would have would it have achieved what it did in relation to the Ottoman <coughs> art or the greater Islamic art that we see in the world? Um, 
because of the fact that it was able to create a synthesis with the Indian Hindu um, influences that, you know, that was, it was able to achieve those things. Do you think that was the part of the, the impetus that actually led to what it is today and that we're discussing about it? No, because if I agreed with that, then I would say that it became great because it's reflected a few local embedded um, forms of art which I don't believe in. So to me, I look at it slightly differently. Um, it didn't come to India, this idea of a few will arrival, something foreign that comes, is actually what a lot of the art historians, the critics, that I'm interested in are trying to counter, and I think it's important to continue doing so, um, even as this is not necessarily how things are being discussed today. So whether it's authentic or not, whether it actually geographically speaking, of course, comes um, from West, uh, yes. But then it becomes rapidly something different. And this whole notion of borders, of course, of nationhood, it goes without saying it's entirely anachronistic. So part of um, art historians defining terms such as Ottoman, such as Mughal, is also trying not to pay too much allegiance to what is happening politically speaking, or to challenge these, or to align themselves with certain intellectual legacies rather than others. Um, so I would rephrase that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, even earlier, right, it's been part of